Okay, so so you got turned on to philosophical and theological well, I met, ideas. I, I took an intro to philosophy course, and we read The Republic, and I met Socrates. Aha. Uh -huh. And what did that do? Well, see, the thing about my upbringing is it had left a taste in my mouth for the transcendence, uh, you know, uh, 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 missing a sage, if I can put it yeah. that way. And then I met this figure of Socrates who um, made the logos come alive and gave me a new way of understanding rationality and made me a way of understanding spirituality and transcendence um, in a way that was consonant with my burgeoning interest in science and reason and that right, so that that was a defragmentation process. Profound, mm -hmm. profound. That's why um, I will not follow. Okay, I will not follow any religion, any su any pseudo religious ideology, any political vision that says you must abandon your loyalty to Socrates. That's not going to happen for me. That's not going to happen for me. And okay, and so what was it specifically about Socrates that attracted you? Do you think? Well. There was a lot originally, I thought, but, that, but that's, but see, Socrates talked about that himself. He talked about how he seduced people into philosophy, right? Because at first it was, oh, look, he wins all the arguments. Yeah, right, right. And, right. and that, you know, when you're a first year student and you're coming out of high school in the meaning crisis, right, that, that's very appealing because then you can, you know, it's, but then you realize the people he's defeating are the sophists, are the people who are after the, the Philo Nikea, not Philosophia. And then you realize that he criticizes him, himself as much as he could, and you get drawn into this, and you get caught up in this process of self-correcting and right, self-transcending, right. and doing it with other people dialogically, getting caught up in, like, uh, you know, Jesus talks about- Yeah, so about, that, that's, is there, is, there, is there something about the essence of higher order meaning that is uh, either analogous to or identical with self-correction? I think, uh, well, I think that's the Axial Revolution. The Axial Revolution, right, when pe people like Siddhartha or people like Socrates, is the recognition that our meaning-making machinery is actually also simultaneously the source of a lot of our suffering. Uh, and, and, that, uh, and that simultaneously empowers us and ch but challenges us. Because, it, I mean... I mean, you know, think about the Dhammapada. You know, the mind is the beginning of everything. And if you don't, if you don't, if like your best, your, the greatest ally you can have is your is your mind. But the greatest enemy you can have right. is, is right, your mind, right? right? right, and, that, right. And, that, and so you get this tremendous. Yeah, because questioning improves, but it also destroys. Right, exactly. And so you, you need a figure that is like Socrates. You know, he's open to following the logos. Wisdom begins in wonder, but there's tremendous courage. He demonstrates it unto death. He demonstrates right, right, it unto right. death. Yep. This is tremendously encouraging for, that was tremendously encouraging for me. And so yep. I got caught up in this and then I wanted to follow this, accept academic philosophy at the time after first year stops talking about wisdom yeah, right. and the love of wisdom. And you get into all of these arguments about meta ethics and meta you know, epistemology. And those are useful tools. You, I, 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 they're useful for science. And so I kept going on for that reason, but this hunger was not being satisfied. So literally down the street from me, there was a Tai Chi meditation center. So I went there because I decided to give Eastern philosophy because I'd been reading some Herman Hesse a chance. And I started doing, practicing Tai Chi Chuan and practicing Vipassana Metta. I was introduced to Lao Tse. I was introduced to Siddhartha. And so these things opened me up. And around that time, I was started to read Pierre Hadot and how our ancient philosophy, the Stoics, and the, and the Epicureans and the Neoplatonists and the skeptics, they also practice philosophy as a way of life. And then I started to realize how much this overlapped with early Christianity and some forms of existing Christianity. It started to help me a rapprochement to Christianity and to religion because I became very, I became very. Well, you've always, you've always struck me at your core as a, as a religious thinker. That is, and, I mean, that, and that's, that's partly because you're right. grappling with deep ideas, and and that's the same thing. But you, you, you're right, and and um, it's one of the things that distinguished you from, say, the other professors that, while well, they were at the University of Toronto, but the, the professorate in general. And I also think it accounts to some degree for your impact on students. I I think that's true. My uh, 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 around this when I when I the episode I did for Awakening to the Meaning Crisis on Agape, I had. Christians, 
Christian ministers like Paul Vanderclay said yeah. that was one of the best presentations of agape. And, and, and then- Yeah, define that for everyone. So other than sort of desire, there's three kinds of love. Eros is the love that is accomplished by consummation. So in, in and I don't mean this in some creepy Freudian sense, but I can have Eros for a cookie because I become one with the cookie by eating it. And we consummate a marriage, right? And, and you consummate a relationship in, you know, in sexual intercourse. And then there's philia, and this is the love that is born out of reciprocity. This is friendship love. This is the love that emerges and affords dialogos. That's why it's philia sophia. It's the dialogical love of wisdom together. And then there is the love that a parent has for a child. You don't love a child because you want to be one with the child. That's exactly the wrong project. Right, right, you're right. trying to make the project yeah. autonomous yeah, from you. Yeah, yeah. And of course, your child isn't your friend when you bring the child home from the hospital. They can't do anything. They're not even a cognitive agent. They're a moral person, but they're not a cognitive agent. Yeah. You love a child. It's like this magic. By You love them because by loving them, you turn them into a full-blown cognitive agent. It's like if I could stare at a sofa and turn it into a Ferrari. It's that kind of, and, 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 and in that sense, it is the most fundamentally profound, creative, engage, and, and we're, and we're cre like, we're, we're not just creating meaning, we're creating the beings that participate in meaning that, as you indicated earlier, could disclose some of the most fun, because they're at the apex of emergence, right? that they can disclose some of the most fundamental aspects of reality. So agape is the deep recognition of that in that sort of voluntary necessity and being compelled to draw into it. And Jesus is, right, Jesus, you know, in the, the epistle of John, God is agape. Jesus is the, the, in, the, the sage of that. Think about what agape means. Jesus comes and he, the, 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 the agapic way, the most excellent way, as Paul says, Agape says, I, to the Roman people in the Roman Empire, we can take all the non-persons of the Roman Empire, all the women, all the children, all the widows, all the slaves, all the impoverished, all the non-Romans, and we can make them into persons because we live the most excellent way of agape. And agape right, is, right. is the God power that turns non-persons into persons. This and that what, conquers the Roman Empire. And, that, and that's why. And the whole ancient world. And that's yeah. why it conquers the Roman Empire, right? And, 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 and precisely. And, and so, and, and my, my partner, Sarah, who's not a Christian, right? And, and I don't profess to be one, but she, she, she took me aside at one point and she said, and I want this understood that I'm saying this at an arm's length, okay? And you're a good friend, so you'll, you'll I'll trust you for that. But she said, you're actually the only real Christian I've ever met. Mm -hmm. What did she mean by that? And well, I, of course I asked yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, right. And she said, because you, you know, she, she said, I get it. You don't identify with a set of doctrines, but you, you try to live agape, agape and you try to follow. Embody the, it. Yeah. Embody it. And yeah, you try yeah. to follow the logos and, yeah. you, and you've structured your whole your whole life and the cultivation of your character around that. And right. you try well, to that's what belief that's that's believe belief. It, to give your heart to. That's what yeah, that's yeah, the original definitely meaning. Is to stake your life on it. That's that's why I have a certain amount of problem with the propositional, the reduction of belief to the proposition. Propositional like, tyranny. That's that's what it is. Well it's also you know, it's propositional tyranny, but it's also substitute it's a substitution. It's like well, now I've got the propositions down. You know, when I talk to some evangelists in, in yeah. Washington, I know some, some very, very wise evangelicals in Washington. Um, they do remarkable work. They're involved in the prayer breakfast there and, and have been for decades, really committed people. And we were having a very serious conversation one day about the errors, let's say, of the evangelical movement, one of them being the substitution of the propositional for the existential. And then the counting of souls, you know, the number of people who accept the propositional creed, which isn't nothing, you know. It's necessary, but it's not well, sufficient. It's also, it's also maybe one way that the propositional can echo down through the emotions and the motivations and become something embodied. But that's a, there's a large journey from the purely propositional, let's say the, apo apo the Apostles' Creed, to actually embodying. There are so many... We, we mentioned this earlier. This is Piaget. This is Socrates. This is Plato through and through. 
There are truths that are only disclosed to you after you go through fundamental transformation. And that is different from assenting to a proposition right. because you have been con convinced of its truth. That it's a very different. See, this is the Cartesian problem. The Cartesian project is here's a universal method that does not require you to undergo existential transformation. You just apply the universal method. It will give you access to all the universal propositional truths. And that's all we need. And that is a big mistake. This is why I practice a form of cognitive science that emphasizes that, that I have a new paper out, I think I sh shared mm -hmm, it with you, mm -hmm. why relevance realization is not computational, because ultimately you can't capture all of that relevance realization, all that binding, all that transformation, all that meaning making in a formal set of propositions. It's just not going to, it's not going to do it for you. Right. Right, right, right. So, yeah, yeah. Well, that's an extension of the argument that the propositional isn't sufficient. Yes. Thank you.